Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to this Harlow Gilston Garden Town Joint Committee of Monday, the 22nd of July. Uh, and uh, we shall get started with the webcast introduction, which I must read as follows. I'd like to remind everyone present at this meeting, uh, or present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing or other such use by third parties. Therefore, by participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. Please also be aware that if there is technical difficulty, uh, if technical difficult difficulties interrupt the meeting that cannot be overcome, I may need to adjourn the meeting. Members are reminded to activate their microphones before speaking and more importantly, turn them off when they are finished. Uh, which takes us to item two, apologies for absence, which there are none. Uh, item three, substitute members. Given there's no apologies, there will be no substitute members. Uh, item four, declarations of interest. Anyone have any interest to declare? Nope, very good. Uh, item five, the minutes of the previous meeting on pages one to three of the pack. Are they agreed by the committee? Yep, very good. Uh, item six, any matters arising or outstanding actions? No, super. In which case we come to item seven, which is request to address the joint committee. Uh, I have had one uh, request to address the joint committee, which is from Councillor Tony Edwards in advance of the meeting, which I've accepted. So Councillor Edwards, you have up to three minutes to address the committee on the items you wish. Hopefully it won't take three minutes, just... Briefly, I just want to uh, address the committee regarding uh, agenda item 11, which is the reimagining how we can travel differently. And in particular, I want to talk about the sustainable transport network, um, particularly the yet to be agreed town centre south link. And I also want to talk about the long term revenue funding for the transport infrastructure. Um, I'm old enough to remember way back sort of 2017, 2016 when we started talking about the development of uh, the Harlow and Gilson town and there was talks then about there being sustainable transport right the way through the town and there was even talks then about the possibility of that sustainable transport link going out eventually to meet to, towards Epping and there'd be a link via, uh, what it's called now, Thayton Bassett and what have you, um, going out that way. And uh, there was also, as there is indeed in this report here, there was also illustrations of a potential tram links and that sort of thing. So we've gone from, and then when we were having discussions at that time, we were, we were seeing um, Harlow as potentially being very, ex you know, it's an exciting vision, as it were, with good transport links going through the town. And we've gone from that to a, a bridge plus the work that's going on in terms of the northern bit, so the northern from uh, Gilson up to Harlow. But there's still huge problems, as far as I understand it, as far as the Town Centre South Link. Now, the Town Centre South Link was going to cut straight way across that field there and straight out to Lutton Priory. Um, and we're now told that, for whatever reason, Essex County Council consider that to be too expensive. And we're now told that the sustain, so-called sustainable transport link will somehow or other weed its way round, weave its way round the existing town centre road structure. All I can say is, as we know, the town centre road structure, the town's road structures are already clogged. Which then brings me on to, so, so there will be a huge issue if you, if you go down that route. The second point I just want to make relates to the long-term revenue funding for the transport infrastructure. Now, in the report, I believe it's page... Ooh, well, one of the pages, anyway. Uh, when it talks about revenue, it's talking about on to long going revenue somewhere between 21 and £48 million pounds revenue structure for that. Now, what I've yet to see to date is any clear plans as to how that revenue is going to be raised in terms of providing the, uh, the bus structures, etc. Um, and so whilst on the one hand, and we, and we know that as far as the town is concerned, the town currently has a, 
uh, and modal use of around about 3%. I'm afraid you've reached the I've three reached minutes, Councillor Edwards. But, but I just I've hope that you'll consider those items. No, thank you very much for your. Um, we've certainly reached the three minutes. <laughs> there we are, I think. No, not quite. Yes, yes, by all means, yeah. No, thank you very much for your uh, address to the Joint Committee. I can tell you, Councillor Edwards, you are the first person ever to address the Joint Committee, which is an honour I'm sure you will hold for the days which you have remaining. But um, I'm sure the Committee will uh, take into account the comments you've made when we come on to the, the relevant item. Uh, there being no other request to address the Joint Committee, it takes us on to item 8 which is the HGGT Annual Review 23-24, uh, which I will uh, propose, if I can have a seconder for that item, Councillor Wagland, and I'll hand over to Naysha to introduce that item. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report uh, presents the annual review for Harlow and Gilston Garden Town for the year 23-24, um, and the last year of activity under our former governance arrangements of the Harlow and Gilston Garden Town Board. Uh, it sets out the achievements of the partnership and notes the considerable support the Garden Town receives from other partners, um, including Homes England um, and uh, the ministry former known as Julac. Um, members will uh, note the increasing activity on the ground um, alongside continuing to prepare a strong policy framework uh, to enable and coordinate the garden town growth. Uh, particular highlights to draw your attention to um, is the start on site of the North to Centre STC funded through the Housing Infrastructure Grant Programme, um, completion and endorsement of the Latin Priory Design Code and the Master Planning Guidance Framework for the East of Harlow which is ongoing. Um, also really important uh, is the joint initiative between uh, Harlow District Council and the Garden Town to um, implement the Discover Harlow Hub in the Harvey Centre. Um, the recommendations to the uh, Joint Committee uh, are that the draft 2023-24 uh, annual review set out at Appendix A is agreed and that there is delegated authority to the director in conjunction with the chair and vice chair to make any minor changes and to publish the annual review. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you for that. Are there any questions? Uh, any members have questions about this report? No? Uh, any comments at all from any members? Councillor Bolton? A very small comment, really. Um, Guy is sort of fading away, both literally and metaphorically. Uh, I think a photo where he's not fading away might be better than the one that's here. Just personal view. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Any further comments? No? Very good. In which case, um, I would just like to add to to Nature's comments that I think what the report evidently sets out is that we are in part, not entirely, but in part moving from uh, design to delivery, from policy to delivery, and there are uh, very tangible outcomes uh, as detailed in the report that show uh, some of the benefits of the Garden Town coming into fruition. Uh, of course, there is disruption that they bring in the short term, but they will be uh, certainly for the greater good. So. With that, uh, are those recommendations agreed by the committee? Very good. Uh, in which case, we move on to item nine, which is uh, the quality review panel annual report, which I think, Kevin, you are to introduce. Yep. And just while we're setting up for that, if I propose that, is there a seconder for this report? Yeah, Councillor Bedford. Kevin, over to you when you are ready. I think we've got a presentation, is that right? So, thank you very much, Chair. And I'll just do some quick introductions. Uh, so I'm, I'm Kevin Steptoe. I'm the Garden Town Lead for East Hearts Council. And in the Garden Town team, I'm the lead for the place shaping and engagement work stream. 
uh, which includes, of course, the quality review panel work. Uh, and with me on the uh, table this evening, we've got Lucy Block. Lucy is an associate at Frame. Uh, Frame are engaged by the uh, Garden Town as the uh, uh, organisation that organises the panel, organises and runs the panel for us. And to my right here is Peter Maxwell. Peter is the uh, Director of Design at the London Legacy Development Corporation, I hope I've got that right, Correct. and uh, more importantly, he's the Chair of the Quality Review Panel for us, so uh, Peter um, uh, leads the panel. Uh, we've got a short presentation for you this evening, so Lucy and Peter are going to run through that, and uh, then obviously opportunity for, for questions from members. Um, just to say uh, up front, obviously, the purpose of the report this evening is to uh, give you the annual report for the operation of the panel over the last year from uh, uh, April 23 through to March of this year and it sets out obviously the range of schemes that dealt with and, and the issues that have come up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to operate this, the slides and I'm going to hand over to Lucy and Peter to talk through them. Thank you. Shall I angle that I'll use that one. Um, thank you everyone. Thank you for inviting us along this evening. Um, you can go to the next slide with me, Kevin. Um, so I just thought I'd briefly introduce um, Frame Projects. Um, it's myself along with my team, Deborah and Ying Lee. Um, we've been working with the Garden Town and Epping Forest District now since uh, 2018, um, of which Peter has been chairing the panel since that time. Next, please, Kevin. Fantastic. Um, so just to say that the the purpose of the quality review panel and the work that we do at Frame and with Peter and with the councils um, is to really champion good design and good quality design and that's recognised um, in national policy through the MPPF about well, achieving well designed places. So everything that we're doing with the Garden Town is really focused on this and picking up on, on this national policy. Next please Kevin. Um, it's also worth noting that design review there are a series of principles that were first established by Kay back in 2006 and then have been kind of developed over the years through Design Council and other people championing this kind of design review, this peer review system. And I think what's really important to, to note and what we've drawn out here is that buildings and places really need to be more than just the aesthetics and the architecture. They need to be about placemaking, health and well-being, and all the kind of infrastructure that supports good communities. So that's really what we're trying to do and what, how we're trying to support the Garden Town team. Next, please. So the value of design review and how that fits into the planning process, we kind of come in at a, at a stage where pre-application conversations have already started taking place. We've been working with applicants to look at sites, realise what can happen there, and then we're in, invited to come along to, to help and to review those schemes. And when design review works well is when it comes early. So you know, we're seeing schemes that are really at an early stage of design when there's a, when we're able to really help move things forward. So it's not just a tick box exercise, those conversations are meaningful and helpful. Um, and we really want to be constructive. We're here as a kind of critical friend at the end of the day. We're not here to make decisions. That's for um, the local authority to do. Um, so yeah, we're really here to kind of really get the most and the best quality out of the scheme. It also works really well when we see schemes more than once. Um, so we really champion this kind of cyclical nature um, and follow-up reviews, whether that's through formal reviews, which I'll come on to, or, or the smaller chairs review format. And it's also worth noting that we're seeing more and more design review included in planning performance agreements. So that establishes up front an expectation with applicants that they need to come to the quality review panel at least once, maybe even twice. So it's, it's factored in, it's budgeted in, and they're aware of that. So you set that expectation up front. Next, please. So the membership of the panel, so as we said, we've been chaired by Peter since uh, 2018, um, but he's also supported by 25 professional experts. And I won't run through all of these, but you can really see from the list behind me the kind of real broad range of expertise. So it's not just architecture, it's all those other kind of elements that really bring together. And what we try and do at each meeting is bring a kind of collection of different views, different thoughts together. So you get this really kind of diverse um, feedback that can help. Um, and we work really closely with the local authorities to make sure this membership is reflective of the needs of the garden town and whether we need to bolster certain experience. So over the years, we've invited more sustainability consultants, 
Um, social infrastructure was another one that we brought in, and stewardship as well, which I believe is um, later on in the um, agenda. Next, please. So we offer three types of review. Um, the most uh, commonly used and for large and more complex schemes is the former review, which is chair plus four of our panel members. Um, but we also offer smaller reviews, workshop reviews, which are much more discursive in nature. We use those quite a lot with policy documents, for instance, but they can also be used to break up kind of large master plans and look at thematic topics. Likewise, we have the chairs review, which is chair plus one, and that can be really useful for much smaller developments, smaller sites, but also for follow-up reviews where maybe only one or two thematic topics need to be kind of resolved before a plan is mission's made. Next, please. So this just gives you an overview of the schemes that we've seen over the last year. Um, so we've had 20 reviews, um, eight of which have been within the Garden Town and 12 within Appian Forest District Council, because the way the panel works, it's shared between those two different areas. We've had 11 returning schemes, so that's where schemes have come to the panel more than once. And you can see um, kind of from the types of proposal, which is the diagram on the bottom left, that the majority of what we've seen this year have been master plans. And that's not really surprising because that since the Gilston area um, master plan um, was approved in principle, um, subject to the section 106 being agreed, a lot of that uh, momentum has started picking back up again. Um, next, please. Um, so this just gives you a bit of an overview about where those schemes have um, are located within the garden town. So we've had one scheme within the town centre. Like I said, a lot of our attention this year has been on the Gilston villages, so we've seen four schemes there. And we've also had two opportunities to review the Latin Priory design code. And um, we've also looked at um, the strategic document around stewardship as well. Um, next. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, opportunities throughout the year to kind of reflect on lessons learned, monitor how the panel is progressing. Um, so we had progress meeting earlier in the year with um, the Garden Town officers, with ourselves and the chair to kind of look at the process and get any feedback. We also do an annual report every year, which was shared as part of the um, notes with the agenda. And we also like to have an annual meeting where we bring together officers um, and the, all the panel members and reflect on what's gone well, what hasn't, and look at some case studies as well and kind of share lessons learned between everybody involved. Next, please. And this is where I'm going to hand over to Peter, who's just going to discuss some of the kind of emerging topics and themes that we've seen over the last year. Um, thank you, Lucy, for that. Um, I suppose there's a, a number of key kind of themes that have developed. On, surprisingly, one of the top ones is about the strategic master plans. Um, we understand as a panel, and certainly I do as a chair, that there's been a lot of time, effort, and preparation, not just in the years preceding the application being submitted, but sometimes decades. And how we best support the local planning authority and you as decision makers um, in terms of the master plans is actually we've looked to try and break these master plans up into thematic areas. And by that, I mean focusing on things like transport first before we get into issues about housing or urban form. And that's been, I think, helpful and successful working with the likes of the Gilston Villages in particular, because they're big, they are big developments in their own right. Um, they are almost, so Lucy mentioned our work at um, London Legacy Development Corporation, that's better known as Olympic Park um, down in East London. Gilston's almost double the size of that in terms of the amount of homes and infrastructure needs to go in and the amount of time and effort needs to look at that. It needs to be done properly, and that's what we're here to do, help support the officers in making the decision and give you the right information as decision makers. So we've kind of tried a number of things in terms of the strategic master plans, and that seems to be working well, and they're bespoke for the specifics of each individual application. If you go to the next one, I think one of the key um, themes that come out with all development that we're seeing is about what is character and identity in the different parts of the garden town and what are developers doing to really understand that rather than just like everybody recognizes that viability is really difficult at the moment in terms of development but that shouldn't mean that when the developers and landowners are bringing forward things that could change will change this part of Essex and Hertfordshire for long term, actually, that they think about very carefully what is the identity that they're adding to and what is specific about the developments coming forward. So 
continually we are challenging on behalf of yourselves and the local planning authority what does it mean in Latin Plurire as opposed to East of Harlow as opposed to Gilson what is appropriate in terms of the type of development coming forward um, and we've been advocating um, with colleagues about um, stronger design guidance particularly um, technical term but design codes and uh, I think some of you have seen those in the past um, we're here as a critical frame we're also here I suppose the point is um, as I said it's not to be a kind of um, quasi planning committee that's for you so we are here to support the development coming forward and make it uh, and improve it as best as possible so my role as I see as the chair is to try and make sure that the the panel that I work with gives prompts and um, our expertise and knowledge and give examples and best practice about how they can improve the schemes that they've got and I think that's really important um, so if we go to the next slide um, sustainability and transport I think um, there's a couple of areas I'd want to kind of highlight here we've been continually nearly every development we're seeing um, keen to understand how they're going to contribute to the overall targets for modal shift because that's imperative one part of the jigsaw needs to support all of the other parts so if it doesn't meet the modal shift and um, it can't really bring forward the overall plans I think we've seen definitely in the last year a kind of improved understanding and awareness in terms of climate resilience of the green infrastructure and kind of biodiversity I think that's obviously been twinned with things coming in like biodiversity net gain in terms of legislation I think the area that's probably less understood and less acknowledged is in terms of actually kind of low to zero carbon development in terms of construction in terms of delivery and how you get there and that's something that we've been trying to support um, applicants as they're coming through the, the process um, I think the last thing I'd like to say is um, this is a two-way discussion between us and the applicant and I'll kind of end and the, the presentation ends on the next slide which is from um, a developer that we've seen repeatedly called GS8 and they're developing in and around this area and um, actually very very innovative in terms of their business model but also in terms of their output they're building kind of um, no bills zero carbon homes for people that don't want kind of very large properties but want a certain kind of product and um, they found the process incredibly supportive and helped them deliver things within a kind of good time and get on to site. So happy to take any questions and thank you all for your time. Very good. Uh, well, thank you for the overview and introduction. And in that vein, do any members have any questions on the QRP annual report? Councillor Waglan. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, I was a vigorous proponent of this from a very early stage when we were first thinking about it because um, I think it is, it is one way of avoiding some of the homogeneity and other problems that are experienced in uh, and make residents feel as though they've just got yet another housing estate and garden communities always seem to me must be more than that and I was seeing a fair few of these bodies coming through and, and overall I have to say um, I, I've got very little by way of anything other than positive to say about them so um, I'm a real fan I like the fact that you've expanded the scope of the areas of expertise because um, you know there's, there's always another category and I think you don't want to discourage developers from coming if there's a particular point they've got um, because you haven't got it on your list but actually you've got the people who will be able to put them in touch with what's actually going on in whatever it is that's uh, that's created for them um, I, I'm also really pleased, and, and I, perhaps we could just, you could just talk about this, um, about the encouragement to design codes, because my understanding is, depending on what happens to our planning legislation, that we have this presumption in favour of a consulted on design code um, being complied with. And that, I think, is, is, is a little understood tool for local authorities and local communities. And, and really significant. Of course, it doesn't really work unless you've got a design panel, it seems to me, who are talking about quality in the context, because it, it sort of seems as though there's a missing piece to the, 
to the jigsaw, but for me that's really important. So if you could um, uh, just talk to us about that. The only uh, negative I have experienced is one occasion in which um, uh, elements which were being required by the local community and the local authority um, were taken by the um, developer to uh, a design panel. Um, who, and the developer requested uh, that it be in effect released from those and that I thought when it happened should have at the least involved the local authority and the residential objectors at least talking to the panel but B seemed to me to be well outside what really is the remit of a, of a dis quality design panel. So if you had any thoughts on that point about design codes and that further point about making sure that quality panels understand their remit shouldn't extend into what is actually the process now for this committee, that would be great. Yeah, um, I would agree in terms of um, the codes are definitely one way to do things and um, they're really important in terms of how they're structured, so similar to, um, they should be kind of specific to each location. Um, there's good examples all, all and down, up and down the country. Um, it's critical that they are kind of fundamentally based on what's called parameter plans, which sets down the amount and scope and where you can put different uses, but the codes are basically the, the granular detail that gives some real clarity about how you can then put those uses onto the land. I think the one thing I would say in terms of, like anything in this world, the devil's in the detail, and the panel is certainly there to help challenge and use the best practice around the panel there, but it needs um, the expertise inside the planning authority as it's going through the process, because the codes are usually used for long-term planning, and that will happen over many years, so making sure that there is somebody in the local authority that understands what has been consented up to a particular point or phase of development and then what is kind of uh, looked at afterwards is really important so that competency is part and parcel not just the panel I would say but the um, we have a lot of good practice and certainly on the panel itself there's a lot of good practitioners who can and are pointing to those examples so those applicants can learn directly from us and other things around the country. Um, do we have terms of reference for the panel? Um, yep. In which case it might be nice to circulate them. I'm sure they're here somewhere. It's probably my fault for not having pulled them out of my system, but uh, it would be good to have a look. And it might be something that we can publicise as well because I think it gives added reassurance. Thank you. Um, and then I'll just come back to you quickly on the panel remit. So, um, yes, the, the terms of reference does cover exactly what the panel's purpose is and, and you know, the level, I guess, of advice that they can give and the standing of that advice. Because effectively, you know, the, the panel is an independent voice um, and a critical friend, but it's very clear up front that they aren't the decision makers. So actually, some of the, the comments that they may provide may be counter to, you know, what is realistic and what the, the committee feel is appropriate. Um, so although the letter is there to help, it's not set in stone that all of those things have to be done. It's just ideas, really, to, to help inform. And um, in terms of applicants coming and expecting the panel to reinforce things they want to do that aren't appropriate, um, we have briefings ahead of the um, the meetings themselves with the case officer, with with people like Kevin and, and strategic um, leaders within the teams to kind of identify challenges, identify pre-application discussions. And in those conversations, often it's quite useful to understand what, what discussions have been going on with the applicant, where there are issues that the panel need to be aware of. And I think, um, you know, a big part of the panel's remit and, and kind of support is to make sure that these places work for local communities. So it is really, we're often um, really keen to hear about how engaged they've been, what kind of public um, consultation has taken place and what the feedback of those meetings has been to then inform how the design is developing. So I would certainly hope that the panel hasn't undermined the committee at any moment in terms of that because we're very strong advocates for that. Very good. Um, 
in lieu of any other questions, I have a, a couple, if I may. Um, one is just to test your feeling uh, both in this year, which we're talking about, and uh, the financial year we're now in, as to whether you think the uh, applicants you've dealt with um, are paying enough attention to the ICB and the um, health authorities and their desire that we hear a lot about for uh, better design in terms of health outcomes and how that, whether that's playing out or not. Uh, enough is the first. And the second was just um, on a point that you made uh, a little bit earlier about um, the capability within the planning authorities. Um, and obviously there's well rehearsed challenges in terms of capacity at the moment in planning authorities, but whether you think within the particular authorities we're talking about, whether you're finding that to be a challenge or not, as the case might be. Um, I think, in all honesty, kind of health outcomes is sometimes, I'm being kind of polite in terms of sometimes it being the front and centre. I think a lot of the time, um, and this comes back a little bit to the, the placemaking character point as just an example, a lot of the time it comes in as an application for X number of homes rather than what is the purpose of these homes, what is the outcome that we're trying to achieve here, what is the outcome you're trying to achieve as a panel, not just in terms of a place to live, a place to thrive, a place to have jobs. That usually has to be pulled from the, the kind of less enlightened developers and that's quite difficult. So getting down to the kind of impacts specifically in terms of health out outcomes the better ones will understand that in terms of green infrastructure, open space, relationship to creating new places and having those things on tap, as well as access to, uh, you were mentioning before, in terms of sustainable transport and different modes of transport. But it is patchy at very best. And there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's some still at the old kind of traditional developer model of, well, we're just trying to get some houses on and that's it. So unfortunately, there's room to, room to happen there, but I don't think that will come as any surprise to any of you about that. There's a mixture. But as I said, the chap that was on the end of the development, the developer I just showed you the kind of quote from, that is really interesting because that's here right in your patch. And I would say that they are kind of pushing the boundary, not just for this area, but they're pushing the boundary nationally. And that's really interesting that they seem to be able to get the financial model to work here and give a better product and give some point of difference and do all the place making and health outcomes better than you see in kind of London and some of the other metro cities. And then just on your point around team capacity, so um, the last couple of years we've dealt predominantly with the same groups of people, a lot with Kevin's team around the Gilston Villages, a lot with Epping Forest's team around the design code of Latin Priory, um, but we haven't had the same level of engagement with kind of Harlow Town and some of the other areas that we haven't seen uh, any of East of Harlow for quite a long time, for instance. Um, so what we've actually um, decided and, and planned to do actually on Wednesday this week is um, have kind of an update session, an upskilling session with all the officers across both the Garden Town teams and um, Epping Forest, and hopefully that will kind of give them confidence to bring schemes forward. I think there's a lot of um, concern maybe that schemes aren't big enough or um, important enough, but actually a lot of the smaller schemes and smaller sites can really unlock potential in town centres. So we're really going to encourage um, applicants to you know, bring a, a whole range of schemes. And um, yeah, and hopefully that will really um, help them if they've got any questions or concerns to actually directly have that conversation on Wednesday. So yeah, looking forward to that session as well. Very good. Any other questions? No, any comments from anyone? Councillor Bedford? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the RP's working really well, especially um, coming from the Epping Forest District Council side. Um, and GSA, who you've put up on the wall there, I know they've been working extremely hard to get stuff through. I suppose really I look at you as a broker. So you broker a deal between like the local authority and the developer and obtain the best for that site out of both sides of the parties. You're in the middle. Um, everything seems to be going quite well at the moment and just thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Very good. Any further comments? 
No, well, just to um, echo Councillor Bedford's words and what's set out in the report and uh, what you've just presented us with, um, I think it would be remiss of us to uh, not note the fact that I think that the expertise that you've drawn in, drawn in is um, incredible uh, and will be of huge benefit for this whole area. You know, um, I don't think there's anyone on this committee or elsewhere that wishes to... Um, not see further improvement in design um, and you know I've seen firsthand uh, with a Harlow Council application the benefit you uh, can have uh, on design accordingly um, but you know you, you certainly don't come at it in a, in a rigid or bureaucratic fashion um, so I think it's of huge benefit to the whole garden town uh, and to the design of of everything that's coming forward so thank you for everything you've done uh, and hopefully uh, this time next year when you report again there will be yet more good news uh, many more schemes will have gone through it uh, so with that uh, we'll move to the recommendations on the report are they agreed by the committee agreed. yep very good okay so we come thank you very much thank you. Uh, we come on to item 10 which is the stewardship charter uh, which I think, again, Kevin is presenting. Uh, so, again, if I propose that as a seconder for that item. Yeah, Councillor Wagland. And, Kevin, we will hand over to you to introduce it. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman. So, um, as you say, this report relates to the... Harlow and Gilson Garden Town Stewardship Charter. This is a piece of policy work that's been developed over the last year or so by the Garden Town teams uh, with input from a range of uh, stakeholders and following a uh, consultation exercise. Uh, it's now in front of you in, in this report for your agreement. Um, stewardship obviously is one of the fundamental issues that, that uh, we've been talking about as a group of local authorities since the beginning of our arrangement as part of the Garden Town. You know, what does stewardship mean for us? Uh, how important is it? What's its impact? Um, how do we deal with it? How do we grapple with it? Um, our vision, our Garden Town vision, which is one of the early policy documents that we produced, sees stewardship very much as a, uh, a golden thread that, that links together uh, delivery of housing, delivery of places, delivery of jobs, employment, economy, uh, and obviously the transport impacts that um, are a significant part of our work. So we've always said that stewardship is a very uh, important fundamental element for us, but we've not really crystallised what, uh, what it particularly means or how we see it as being uh, implemented in the, in the garden town. So just by way of, way of a bit of background, back in 2020, we first commissioned some consultants to consider the issue for us and to give us some first uh, recommendations in relation to how stewardship could be delivered uh, across the garden town. And they came forward with recommendations about the types of models, the types of legal models that could be implemented that would give us the best outcomes, um, but they didn't give us conclusions at that stage around around the geography. So so we moved on a step. Members con considered, continued to consider stewardship and um, back in 2022, we were asked as a team of officers to um, formulate some stewardship guidance. Uh, that was the request so that we had a position that we could publish that, that made it clear uh, how we see stewardship. Um, we crystallized that through member engagement in workshops and, uh, as I say, through a consultation exercise. And our view, and this is set out in this, in this charter now, our view, we're saying that stewardship comprises the inclusive, proactive and responsive planning, placemaking and care of new places. And it's always very difficult to crystallise stewardship in much less than, uh, there's probably 10 words or so there, it's always very difficult to uh, capture it in much less than that. Um, but that's a pretty pithy uh, um, uh, statement of what we see as stewardship. Um, just for the avoidance of doubt for members, there is some more work going on in the officer team at the moment 
uh, around the potential uh, for us as a group of, of authorities to uh, take on a more of a direct role in stewardship. Uh, that's a different piece of work. That's not the subject of the report this evening. Uh, but just to make sure that, that members are clear, that work is still continuing. Uh, so this is very much a policy piece of work that you have in front of you this evening. We'll be coming back, of course, to, to the uh, Joint Committee in due course with another piece of work about what's the potential role for uh, the Garden Town Partners in delivering stewardship. Is it just a case of uh, uh, working with developers or are we taking a more uh, direct role? That's, that's a decision for later. That's not what's in front of you this evening. Uh, what you do have in front of you is uh, a set of high-level principles for stewardship. The six principles set out in the Charter. Uh, as I say, they're, they're very strategic, they're very generic in nature, they've been formulated in a way that suits the range of sites potentially coming forward from, obviously, Gilston, where we have a, 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 a developer that's reasonably advanced in their thinking around stewardship um, to some of those sites where th that thinking hasn't taken place yet. So they're very generic in nature, they're very strategic, they're very high level. Um, we felt they were appropriately framed in that way so they could be applied across the Garden Town geography. Um, it's been subject to consultation in the, in, in, in the normal way that we seek to do, to in, include as many stakeholders as we can. All of the normal uh, um, comms around that have taken place. That, that uh, took place towards the end of the last part of uh, the second half of last year, sorry. Um, it's not uh, necessarily an issue that, that many people will have uh, strong views about these sort of principles. When it comes to the day-to-day -day care of places, of course, people do get far more uh, interested and excited, but the high-level principles maybe don't generate that level of excitement. We didn't have a huge number of responses, but you can see from the appendices that they covered quite a range of issues. Uh, so you've got with you this evening, and uh, there is a lot of material, but it was just to show you uh, the, the work that's taken place. You've got the outcomes of the consultation with proposed amendments to the draft, um, the draft charter. You've got the QRP report, and you heard the, uh, the uh, rep representatives just now talking about their work. The QRP have assessed this policy document for us. Uh, we've got, you've got our response to the QRP's um, uh, advice in relation to the stewardship charter. Uh, we, uh, we particularly want to engage with young people around stewardship. Uh, this is one of our quality of life outcomes that seek to ensure more engagement with the younger audience and we commissioned some work around that you have the report in as one of your appendices uh, you have some scenario testing around the uh, charter and finally uh, in appendix g you have the draft final charter as it now stands following all of that consideration of, of consultation feedback and amendment um, so chairman i think that's uh, all I need to say. Obviously, I can uh, respond to any questions, but it's being put forward now, of course, for uh, the uh, agreement of the Joint Committee. And, of course, in its uh, authority that the Joint Committee now has uh, as a piece of policy work coming forward, if the committee is minded to agree this this evening, this uh, becomes in place. Uh, from now, it changes from our previous arrangements, of course, when we went back round the decision-making, the individual partner authorities because of the delegation that we now have in this committee we can agree it and it becomes implemented uh, thereafter uh, so it's it's a positive move forward and that's hopefully another example of the good work that uh, the committee can now do in its um, its new governance setup thank you chair uh, thank you very much kevin uh, for that introduction i would certainly endorse what you've just said this is uh, the first hopefully of very many examples of the role of the new committee um, and the fact that it can take such decisions uh, in the best interests of our place accordingly. So do any members have any questions on this? Councillor Wagland. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to endorse uh, what you said. I'd also like to pay tribute to some seriously hard work on the part of officers. Um, this wasn't an easy task. They've been able to distill it down into, into a charter format. Um, particularly impressed by the engagement of young people in shaping this. Um, for me, one of the shocks probably of the period um, over COVID was the number of young people taking on properties and discovering to their horror uh, what bad stewardship really looks like. 
and that was at an, an early stage. Bad stewardship, it always seemed to me, from my past in, in dealing with planning, it always seemed to me to be a function of older schemes. But no, the new schemes were really producing all sorts of horror stories, including people losing their properties uh, because of a dispute over service charge where they might very well have been in the right. So for me, this is, this is a huge positive to have gone to the charter format. And I'm very, very grateful in particular to Kevin and to his team, but also to the Essex County Council team and uh, uh, Chris Downs in particular, who's had to put up with me for far longer than anyone sanely should have to do in order to uh, uh, take on board the points that um, I had uh, been in the process of learning the hard way and that I was determined that um, people in our communities would not face that we would make a, a concerted effort to make sure that developers didn't um, leave uh, a, an estate, walk away from it without having left it in a condition in which the local people could, could manage it and could uh, live ordinary lives of the kind that they would be able to do if they weren't buying uh, in a community uh, of that kind. So um, uh, I, I'm vigorously in favour of this and look forward to any other comments that, that come forward in the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any further questions? Uh, Councillor Crystal? Yep. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what, what Leslie said. Um, <clears throat> and as you said, Kevin, there are a few people who really care passionately about high-level policy. Um, and obviously much more, m many more will care more deeply about the, the details and the, the practicalities. But I think it's really important to recognise that the incredible amount of work that's gone into this uh, and to thank uh, you and your teams uh, for, for doing it all. Any further comments, Councillor Bolton? Thank you. Um, it's a good piece of work, this, and an important document. Um, I only hope that the uh, planning authorities are robust in following out or carrying out what it says here. The charter will be taken into account when assessing the acceptability of development proposals. And the Garden Town partners expect landowners and developers to sign up to the charter. The difficulty arises when they sign up but when actually their proposals come forward, they don't fulfil the requirements of the Charter sufficiently. And I think it'll be important that the planning authorities are robust in their interpretation and indeed acceptance or not uh, when it happens. Very good. Any further questions or comments? No, in which case um, I will just conclude by saying, um, you know, I agree with, with all the contributions that have just been made. I can't entirely endorse your um, uh, toing and froing with your officers, Leslie, and as to how painful that may have been. But uh, having heard you in other circumstances, I think uh, the Charter is uh, more robust for those contributions, I have no doubt. But to, to the point um, that Stephen has just made, I think everyone uh, knows of circumstances where developments come forward and stewardship has not been thought out. Uh, very well, and as Leslie said, um, that sadly too often is to the benefit of developers and not the people uh, who have moved into those developments. So this is an absolutely crucial piece of work, uh, which you know is absolutely at the heart of uh, the vision of the Garden Town and creating genuinely sustainable communities in all forms of the word uh, that will be fantastic places for our people to live in. Um, so it's you know, really is a strong piece of work. And as Kevin said, uh, is the first part of that, and there is much more to come on this, uh, I know. So with that, are the recommendations to item 10 agreed by the committee? Agreed, yep, very good. Which takes us on to, uh, thanks Kevin, takes us on to item 11, which is reimagining how we can travel differently, uh, the modal transition delivery framework. Uh, which I will hand over to Naisha to introduce. Thank you, Chair. I'll just wait for Rob to plug in. We have a presentation for you this evening. Just check that's working. Brilliant. Okay, I'll just do a short introduction. And to um, introduce the Joint Committee to uh, Rob Goodall, um, who is from Arup and has been working with the Garden Town Council partners 
to develop the report that is presented to you uh, this evening. Um, just a short introduction. Uh, members will remember that the garden town growth and the local plan commitments are predicated on modal shift targets. Um, what this actually means that is that over a generation, and generation we are aiming to provide alternative ways that people can travel sustainably when they want to. And hence the name of this framework you see this evening is called Reimagining How We Can Travel Differently. The targets are also part of our Garden Town status from government. Uh, they agreed in the Garden Town Transport Strategy, which is already endorsed through the formal planning uh, processes of the five councils. Um, so what this report is about is to uh, provide the initiating framework of how we start looking at how we can travel differently and how we can provide uh, solutions for people to be able to do that. Uh, it's an unfunded plan in the same way as your infrastructure delivery plan is an unfunded plan, um, but it signals our intent about what we want and enables us to have those conversations with government um, and the developers to make sustainable travel a reality. Um, so I will hand over to Rob um, and he will take you through uh, this report. Thank you. Thanks, Nisha, and good evening, everyone. Um, as Nisha said, my name's Rob Goodall. I'm an Associate Director um, with Arup. Uh, I sit within our transport consulting team. Uh, I'm a Chartered Transport Planner. Uh, Arup are a multidisciplinary disciplinary, uh, company full of uh, designers, architects, planners, thinkers, uh, and we're completely employee-owned, uh, and we set our own destiny in terms of the type of work we work on, and this is obviously a very, very interesting piece of work which we're going to take you through this evening. So the, the purpose of this presentation is really to give an overview of the report. Uh, hopefully you've all seen it within your pack circulated in advance of this meeting. Um, we were commissioned by uh, HGT and all partners um, to work with them and in conjunction with them to develop this, uh, this framework. And what it does, it highlights the challenges, risks, opportunities and approach to travel behaviour within Harlow and Gilston. Um, what I'm here to do really is to share those recommendations with you and take you through the delivery pathway that we've developed in conjunction with all our partners obviously seek approval on the final documentation. So to just give you a bit of an introduction, I'll try not to uh, repeat what uh, Nesha said in her introduction, but essentially what we're looking at is how travel behaviour could be influenced or reimagined within the uh, Harlow and Gilston town area. So the purpose of the work is to set out how those objectives established within the HGT transport strategy developed in 2022 could be achieved under a number of different scenarios. Um, for context, uh, a travel survey was done last year, 2023, that indicated that currently there's a 23% sustainable mode, um, mode share within the area. So we've taken on board all that background information and we've devised a methodology of prioritised interventions of how travel behaviour could change and meet those stated objectives. As Nature also introduced, um, this, this purpose of this delivery plan has a, a number of different key purposes. So. Number one, this is a tool to leverage Section 106 funding contributions from developers to support the achievement of those objectives. Two, a mechanism to obtain funding from central government departments. Three, a pathway to discharge the conditions of the housing infrastructure grant. And four, a technical base supporting information for local transport plans, whether they're existing or emerging or in development. Uh, and it's important to note, as I said, um, these interventions are currently unfunded, therefore a clear objective will use it as a hook to leverage that financial support to deliver. And a bit more context, and hopefully many people around the room will be acutely aware of this. Um, there are transport strategy objectives that set out the modal share that will uh, need to be achieved in future. So 50% of all trips starting or ending within the existing settlement of Harlow Town should be by active and sustainable modes. And 60% of all trips or starting or ending in the new garden communities of Harlow and Gilston Garden Town should be bioactive. So that's the difference between the existing area of Harlow and also the future communities that will be in those developed areas. So the key takeaways from that is that Harlow residents will need to change their behaviour. This is not just about the, the, the new communities. There will need to be a change in the way people travel within Harlow itself. And those new strategic sites will need to set out, we've heard from the presentation earlier about the quality review panel, they will need to set out how those things will be achieved in the future as well. And just for context as well around the grant determination agreement, so there's the wording there, we need to basically respond back to uh, that agreement about monitoring and evaluation back to the Department of Transport around how the evaluation of travel plans and meeting those sustainable and active mode uh, objectives are progressing. 
and also the potential approaches to meeting that requirement. So this is a key document and actually going back to the Department for Transport on their needs as well. So there is a key takeaway there around the clear and effective need for a monitoring and evaluation plan and this work will need to set out how potential approaches will meet the requirements both existing and those in the future. And it is a big challenge. As we all know, there's a huge amount of growth that is planned uh, in Harlow and Gilston, Garden Town. As you can just see there, the, the growth in the number of homes uh, over the next period is, is quite significant. So underpinning that, underpinning that, there needs to be a key pillar of that sustainable development needs to be around sustainable trans modes of transport and how that is delivered and how that is achieved. Just for context, in, again, I've talked about it earlier. We did a travel survey uh, last year and uh, it was 23% of people travelling sustainably. In order to meet those targets, we need to near doubling of the people using sustainable modes within the existing town. And actually, based on the interventions that are currently proposed or, or in train, there's going to need to be a significant change in the over and above the existing measures that are planned. For the strategic sites, that target is even, is even wider, so they have a much higher share of active and sustainable modes, so that will require a new style of development which favours sustainability and delivers a step change. In, in mobility patterns. And just for context there, active and sustainable transport includes walking, cycling, bus and train, and non-sustainable vehicle passenger or driver, just for clarity. Whilst percentage shares um, make sense to some people within the transport planning industry, what, what people really want to see is, is the not sort of the numbers. So that increase in the number of homes, the number of people travelling, uh, and increase in those sustainable modes, that's going to lead to, that's going to, lead to an additional 90,000 trips per day if there's no reduction in the trip rate. I won't go into too much technical detail set out in the report, but we are imagining people are going to make less trips in future, more sustainably. If they're making more localised trips, they're not going to need as many trips. That's due to changes in delivery, servicing, uh, online retailing, all those sorts of things. So our plan and framework sets out a number of different future scenarios where people will travel possibly less and they will to significantly change the way they do travel between sustainable and non-sustainable modes. So on to reimagining travel and, and really what does, what does that mean really? Um, how we set out the report, it sets out a number of different themes that are set out within the transitional framework which um, are set out here. So there's a theme around road, streets and neighbourhoods, there's a theme around increasing bus use, increasing shared mobility and active travel which uh, Harlow and Gilson going to town have already made some fantastic inroads in, in delivering some of that. Targeted engagement programmes, so I talked about the need to change behaviour, behaviour change programmes to actually work with uh, residents to understand how, what are the barriers to them changing their behaviour. It's not just all about building uh, infrastructure, it's also about working with people to find out the best way they can travel. We've also got rebalancing the cost of travel, and that's around looking at parking strategies to see how the impact of, of pricing of car parking could impact people's behaviour, and also around sustainable freight and delivery. Whilst that doesn't lead to a modal shift by itself, it's really a very good complementary measure to ensure that you're making the best use of your highway and road space as you go forward. And just to set out what the scenarios are that we've worked through, um, we've provided three different scenarios that have been developed to really give an indication of what are the different potential pathways to achieve those objectives. Uh, the first is sort of business as usual, as things are planned, carry on going, but no significant changes over and above that committed infrastructure and only a small change in behavioural change programmes, not currently planned. The second uh, scenario is around an ambitious programme, so that's trailing the target, um, but actually progressing towards those objectives over the longer term. So they may need to be over and above what is already planned in terms of more transport, sustainable transport infrastructure and a few different schemes that come in there. Some of them might be quite controversial and they may be high cost, um, but they're not delivered in this scenario. They're actually delivered in the exemplar. And on to the exemplar. So the exemplar is the whole framework that's really deliver everything that's within it. So that might require difficult decisions to be made on those delivery of those more controversial uh, measures. Um, but really enforces that growth in public and active transport through improved services and land use changes, working with uh, developers and the quality review panel and others to check and challenge some of the developments that are coming forward. So just to take th people through a, a scenario, a worked up scenario. So in an exemplar scenario for Harlow, um, the objectives are met. So those sustainable uh, sh mode share targets that we set out at the beginning of this presentation are met. Um, which means that traffic and congestion actually doesn't increase. You might have seen one of the bar charts earlier. Actually, that, real, that 
shift in sustainable modes compared to non-sustainable modes means that traffic volumes don't actually increase over and above the current day, but there are a lot more people travelling sustainably. But that does require changes to the way uh, the network is served and the services that are provided around public transport. So using available resources, HGT successfully delivers those interventions and it contributes to those targets in the short term. Timely delivery of STCs and other public transport increases the public support for further interventions. Um, there's more, there's less congestion on the roads, which enables reprioritisation of some um, road space and development of more active transport networks. Uh, working from home uh, has a sustained um, impact on people's behaviour, and e-bikes and shared mobility really complement that. So that's just a bit of a worked example of how that would that exemplar would work within Harlow. So as you can see there, we've set out how the transition moves from the number of trips that are currently done now and the share of those to how they are in the future in 2035 where you're meeting those objectives and some of the interventions and schemes which are planned to try and get to that objective. Likewise, in the report, we've also set out how this would work for a strategic site. Um, this also sets out that pathway and how those design interventions and that good work with the planning authorities and those developers at an early stage can really set out a new uh, way of development, that land use, making sure sites have, uh, have viable services on site, make sure they're mixed use, so that is the reduced need to travel across the whole state, but they're also linked in well with Harlow. Some of these things can't work in isolation. The, the strategic sites need to work closely with the existing town to make sure that those benefits for all that sustainable transport is felt by all residents with either new and existing. So just on to the summary. Um, just quickly, I realise I'm just going slightly over time, but this sets out our combined delivery pathway. So. Um, this sets out exactly all what's planned over the, the short, medium and long term going into the future, but also there's additional um, schemes and interventions that we've programmed across um, that transition framework to ensure that those exemplar scenarios are met. So this gives an example of what would need to be delivered in our view, in our professional experience, to maximise the opportunities of reaching that, uh, those targets and those objectives set out within the transport strategy. So obviously, it goes without saying, but HGT will need to assess the deliverability of supporting those interventions under those different delivery themes uh, with respect to resource constraints, but also the funding environment as well. But we feel this transition framework gives the best uh, opportunity to take that forward and actually leverage that funding, both with developers, central government, and others. And that's the end. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, any questions or comments from committee members? Yep, Councillor Bolton. Thank you for that very interesting uh, presentation. You know, the modal shift in transport is probably one of the most difficult things to achieve here um, because whereas the development outside of the town will affect mainly people who will buy houses, etc., the modal shift also includes the people who are existing residents because from the figures we've seen, the travel, the number of um, <clears throat> journeys carried out and the, the type of transport will need to change for existing residents as well. It won't be just for new people, it'll be for the existing people. And that's probably more difficult to achieve. It's more difficult to achieve for the existing people than it is for the new people. So an interesting presentation. I, I think we'll see how it goes. Very good. Any further questions or comments? Councillor Wagon. Thank you, Chair. I just wonder whether we can uh, undertake the review that's going to need to be done of new government legislation and its agenda. We know that they're already talking about modal shift and uh, um, modal shift rather than modal choice, which is interesting. Um, but to undertake that review and for this committee perhaps to delegate to Nasha as lead officer uh, the agreeing of minor amendments following uh, that review. Um, I know, Chair, you've, I don't think we've seen your forward yet for this either, so that would probably be something that ought to be circulated to this committee to, uh, to review. Perhaps that could be done offline, but, but um, forgive me because there may be other comments on the substantive stuff, but I just thought in terms of process going forward that might be useful. Yeah, so I'm very happy to uh, share the foreword, by all means, before that's put into the final document. We'll come back to the recommendation, but I think it's a very sensible point about a review in line with um, 
where things are currently, and then we can update the document if required. But we'll come back to that at the end of the debate, if that's okay. Liz. Um, any further questions or comments from anyone? No, in which case we've reached the end of the debate, so we'll come back to Leslie's point. Um, so, as I understand it, you're proposing we add in a, another recommendation, which is um, for uh, Nasha and her team to review latest legislation and government policy and update the document accordingly if required. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. Do you want to come in on that? Yep. Increased flexibility to to be able to deal with things that are not substantive and get and get the job done. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Waglin. Um, uh, I think that's very sensible. Um, I'm just wondering if we can do it in um, maybe in two halves, because although we have the principles of some legislative change that's coming through, we don't know much in terms of detail yet. Um, and I think it might be helpful to the partnership for us to have something that's a first draft that we can use in our discussions, and then we can come back... October, or I've actually, the, one of the recommendations is that we update in spring 2025, but we could work with uh, the Joint Committee in order then to, as we get more information about those, provide a further iteration over, say, the next six months. Chair, if I might just come back, I mean, I, I think that sounds incredibly sensible. I, I, just to flesh out, I mean, my concern about this is that is we, we have better buses rather than bus back better or whatever the previous versions have been um, but we don't actually know what that means and that would be a really major factor it would be annoying I think not to have reviewed where the direction of travel for want of a better description is well, perhaps it's a very appropriate description and then be able to, to um, adapt to that I think you're right Nisha that we, we would then need to review it on a rolling basis to see what happens with that agenda because a new administration often has to make shifts of its own modal shifts. So um, that, that was my rationale for it. Buses seemed like a really good example of one that you could get hopelessly wrong because the legislative agenda was going to be different from what you imagined, possibly more ambitious, possibly less so. But either way, um, we don't really want to have to do a complete upending of this report. Yeah, so I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Leslie. Um, are you happy that we stick with uh, recommendation D as it is, that an update on progress reported back in spring, uh, with an understanding from the committee that um, that will involve further engagement and reviewing legislation as it comes forward in more detail? By, you know, by the autumn, I presume all of those bills will have been laid and there will be much greater understanding of the detail of them. Yeah, and, and then it will come back to the committee. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. 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 No, I'm I'm very happy with that. No further comments or questions. No. Okay. In which case, I think it's um, you know, firstly. Uh, to, to Arup for um, a very comprehensive report on what, as Stephen said, is a very complex matter. Um, you know, I don't think anyone fails to recognise quite the scale of what we're talking about. And when you understand that uh, the garden town in nine, ten years' time, uh, we're suggesting will be the same size as Cambridge or Exeter um, or Guildford or Norwich, um, that, you know, it, it doesn't seem such a distant concept that we will have to do something dramatically different on active travel, um, you know, moving away from where things are currently. Having said that, does that mean it's not an enormous challenge, uh, particularly as Stephen rightly says, uh, when you talk about existing residents moving from 23% sustainable journeys as they are currently to 50%, um, you know, that it, it doesn't take a genius to work out that requires something genuinely pioneering uh, and, you know, 
massively different to where things are now. So I think what the report does, however, capture, um, and it's something I was very keen on, I know the committee was in its previous form in the board, uh, is that the in interventions that are referenced are, um, shall we say, more carrot and less stick. Um, they are about providing genuine alternatives uh, to people to be able to change their travel patterns as opposed to uh, banning the car and closing every car park type thing, um, which is really, really important. So, as I said, this is something that is genuinely pioneering. Uh, I'm not aware of too many places of the size that have uh, had such ambitious targets in such a short period of time, um, but I think this is a really strong report, uh, and I certainly endorse those recommendations. So, with that, are the recommendations agreed by the committee? Yep, very good. Uh, so that takes us on to item 12, uh, and we have an exempt section that forms part of this report, um, and uh, this progress report has been provided to the public, so they're aware of current updates, but given their exempt sections, I propose that we move that, deal with the rest of the uh, business, and then we will come to that in private session if everyone has agreed to that. Yep. So we'll come to item 13, any other business? I've not been made aware of any, I don't believe there is. Item 14 is to note that the next meeting of the Joint Committee will be on Tuesday the 22nd of October. Uh, and item 15 is the exclusion of the public and press, I'm afraid. Um, so I propose uh, under section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, uh, that the public and press should be excluded from the meeting for the items of business set out below on the grounds that they'll involve likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in the following paragraphs of part one of schedule 12a of the act as amended or are confidential under section 100a2 so if i propose that is there a seconder to move into a private part two yep councillor bolton is that agreed by the committee yep very good uh, in which case uh, I'm afraid, folks, we now move into private meeting to consider the rest of the business. So thank you very much for your attendance this evening. And hopefully we'll see lots of you at the next meeting on the 22nd of October.